You may be seated.
Welcome to this service that commemorates the life of Christ H. Yoder. We've gathered today in the name of Jesus, the one who said, blessed are they that mourn. And Jesus invites all of us to this service. Jerry, Irene, Betty, Carol, and your spouses, and the grandchildren, and the siblings, the neighbors, friends, fellow church members, and all who've come to grace this house today, welcome to the service in the name of Jesus. Jesus said that I have come that they may ha might have life and that they may have it more abundantly. He had just said before that that I am the door of the sheep. And so he's made the, the invitation for all of us to get to know God through his work. I am the door. And then he had also said that those that enter in by another way are thieves and robbers and so on. And then he said, I'm come that they might have life. And thankfully, that includes us too. For he said, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. That's so wonderful that that is still true. Jesus saves us from our sins. And Brother Christ believed this. And he gave ready testimony of the fact that Jesus had done a work in his life, that he had been delivered from sin. And, you know, as we live and walk this veil of tears, we do so imperfectly, but we always come back, as Brother Christ exemplified, to claim again the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember him saying on a number of occasions that I'm doing better than I deserve. Let us bow for prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the privilege that we have to join together in the memory of one who lived among us and who loved you well and served you with devotion and gave his best to serving heartily as to the Lord. Thank you for the family, and we stand with them today. We thank you for their testimony and how they are uh, standing together in this time. I pray that you would lead them, guide them, comfort them, and strengthen them today and always. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now we'll turn the time over to Aaron. Yoder to uh, lead us in a, a several congregational hymns. Good morning. Let's turn to number 585. <clears throat> Some of you may recognize this song as being one of Dottie's favorites. I think it describes the life he tried to live. Number 585. <laughs> Follow the path of Jesus. Walk where his footsteps lead. Keep
Number 793. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides. Thank you for leading us in that spirited singing, to trust and obey, and in fellowship sweet we'll sit at his feet. How blessed it is to think of that future day and to trust that Christ is enjoying that already in whatever provision and timing that the Lord has in the life beyond. 
I want to think this morning about the thoughts, or at least a lot of the thoughts, that come from Psalm 90. Psalm 90 is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. And I'll read the first 14 verses here for you. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning they're like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows up. In the evening it is cut down and withers. For we have been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we are terrified. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And have compassion on your servants. O satisfy us early with your mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. So in this psalm, Moses, the man of God, thinks about the eternity of God and the frailty of man. We suppose that possibly he could have written this about the time of the events of Numbers chapter 20. In Numbers chapter 20, we have the death of Moses, of Miriam, Moses' sister, and the sin of Moses in striking the rock in the wilderness, which kept him from the promised land. And thirdly, the death of Aaron, Moses' older brother. So Moses starts out here, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. It's a, it's a reassurance. The sovereign Lord has been our refuge through these generations. Not only in the exodus from Egypt, which had just happened you know, a number of years before, perhaps. But the, all the pilgrim wanderings that started from Abraham, the patriarch, to the days of Moses would probably be the understanding here. So God has been their refuge and their protection through all of these things. And then he says, before the mountains were created... You know, before all of the earth was created, before the earth was populated with living things, including man, you were God. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Eternity past to eternity future. God exists, and he exists independent of all of his creation. And then the psalmist goes on, you turn man to destruction. You know, death is sure. We all are facing it. We might say sometimes, I've got to live or I've got to make a living. And in one sense, it's true. But really, in a more basic sense, we've got to die. And after this, the judgment in this verse it says, You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men. And we understand this return to not be a reminder to repent and turn to God, 
but a command to return to the dust from which man came. Well, we probably hardly need that commandment in a way because we know that this is the result of our first parents' choices. And then, some more poetic language, a thousand years are to, the, to God like a day. And then we're compared to, to grass and to a watch in the night and to the floods that can come so quickly after a rain. And Moses is poetically repeating the idea of God's eternal being here. He's saying that a thousand years are just like a day in God's sight. And then he says something about it's in the past, a thousand years when it's past, not even the present. Can you imagine with me how it would have probably felt to Moses and his fellow children of Israel when they were in the, the wilderness, it seemed like they were under the sentence of eternal wanderings and patience and waiting for death to come. And time would have seemed to pass slowly, I believe. But Moses somehow knew that this isn't God's perspective. God's perspective, perspective of time's passing is very different from ours. And then he gets pretty serious when he says, we've been consumed by your anger and terrified by your wrath. I suspect it must have been pretty crushing for Moses to see a whole generation melt away in the wilderness. They were dying away under the judgment of God. They couldn't enter into the promised land because of their choices as a group. He talks about the iniquities of the children of Israel and even the secret sins. And he's, it's all against the backdrop of this holy, eternal God. When he saw their sins, his response was anger and wrath. And Moses understood that God's anger against his people was not unreasonable or unearned. And then he talks about for all our days have passed away. And another little quote here is that our years are like a sigh. With poetic clarity, Moses compared the eternal nature of God with the frail nature of man. And I see that this frail nature of man has a couple of understandings. One is that we're frail physically, but the other is we're frail spiritually. So, if we're right that it was towards the end of the desert wanderings that Moses wrote this sublime psalm, with imagery that was borrowed from the wilderness, for example, the watch around the campfire at night, the rush of the mountain flood, the grass that sprouts so quickly after a rain and is quickly scorched, and the sigh of the weary pilgrim. Well, moving on, Moses says the days of our lives are 70 years. Well, according to Deuteronomy, we understand that Moses lived 120 years. And I don't believe that Moses used this figure as either a promise or a limit to man's lifespan, but that it's a poetic estimate of a lifespan. The emphasis here in this psalm is on the futility of life. Even if one should live past 70, the end of it is only labor and sorrow. Well, maybe that's a bit melancholy. Let's notice the next line. A prayer of Moses is to teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So as Moses considered the frail nature of humanity and the righteous judgment of God, it made him ask God for wisdom to understand the shortness of life. You know, the number of days 
How do you number your days? We don't really know how long we're going to live, do we? Well, it's, it's hard, isn't it? You know, we can number our herds. We can total the revenues of our farms. Yet we're persuaded that the days of our life are infinite. We're going to live forever. Sometimes we think sort of that way. And therefore we don't number them. So teach us here tells us that there's something that can be learned. We can give a little thought to what lies beyond this life, and we do better than when we don't number our days, when we don't take a look at the relative shortness of our lives. And then a heart of wisdom, that we may gain a heart of wisdom, is Moses' prayer. A heart of wisdom is one that lives for eternity in which the pilgrim acquaints himself with God and that dies in his favor and lives with him eternally. And one of the things that's a benefit to living to the age that Chris did is that the longing for God and heaven increases. He certainly had that heart throb in these last years. Billy Graham said, There comes a moment when we all must realize that life is short, and in the end, the only thing that really counts is not how others see us, but how God sees us. Unquote. I'd like to think about that this, this morning. There will be undoubtedly a number of things that we will say about Christ. And so it'll be what we saw, what we heard others say and see. But all of us do well to be reminded of the truth of Graham's quote, that ultimately it's important that we that we, give, that we realize we give account to God, and that's the most basic and important concern. Well, turning the page a bit in my Bible, I come to another part of Moses' prayer. Return, O Lord, how long, and have compassion on your servants. So Moses is praying for God's return. And I suppose all of us thinking again of the eternity of God and the frailty of man are getting homesick for his return. And we yearn for that. The only hope for God's people is for God to return to us. And then the last verse I read, O oh, satisfy us early with your mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Probably this means that let's come to salvation early in life so that we may rejoice all our days. So whatever the case is, when God speaks to us, let's come to him and let us rejoice in all the rest of our days. I believe that Moses understood that satisfaction of the lasting kind is not rooted in money or in fame, or romance, or pleasure, or success. It is satisfied really only in God's mercy. Oh, satisfy us early with your mercy. In closing, I want to read a, a poem by Isaac Watts. I'll praise my maker while I've breath. And when my voice is lost in death, praise shall employ my nobler powers. My days of praise shall ne'er be past, while life and thought and being last, or immortality endures. Happy the man whose hopes rely on Israel's God. He made the sky and earth and seas and with all their train. His truth forever stands secure. He saves the oppressed 
He feeds the poor, and none shall find his promise vain. I'll praise him while he lends me breath, and when my voice is lost in death, praise shall employ my nobler powers. My days of praise will ne'er be past, while life and thought and being last, or immortality endures. What we praise, if we praise God now, we can recognize that that will transcend death and go with us in immortality. Now will Brother Aaron come and lead us in several more hymns? Please turn to number 390. I appreciate how the devotional goes along with the song. We have an assurance with Christ. Number 390. <coughs> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Lord of this spirit, washed in his blood. This is my soul.
the time has come to say goodbye. Christy will be missed. He leaves a big hole in our hearts. The family, in the community, and in the church. He's one of the last handful of charter members that have been attending here regularly at, at center. He will be missed. The Psalmist David encourages us to seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. So we look to the Lord for the strength that comes from his holy divine presence. The Lord is the one who has been our dwelling place in all generations. He is the one who asks that we return to dust. He's the one who invites us to teach, to number our days so that we may get a heart of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Continuing on in Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. Now dropping down to verse seven, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. When I think of these two verses, make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. And though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. I think of some of the hard things that Christy faced in life. The, uh, the gas explosion as a 25-year-old that severely burned his body, resulting in a 17-week hospitalization. He lost four sons to death and his dear wife. The death of his young son, Marvin, at age eight. His firstborn adult son, Daniel, at age 36. Followed by son, Delmer, less than a year later. Then two years ago, he lost his dear wife of 66 years. May, and now more recently, his middle-aged son, Arthur. I, I cannot imagine the, the cumulative grief that knows no bounds or season. But I believe that you, as a family, have understood loss, as few families do. One of you said, Dad taught us how to grieve by example. Mm -hmm. It doesn't pay to get bitter. God is sovereign. Another one of you said that suffering embraced enriches us. So we think of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 
verse 3 and following. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted of God. By God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope, and he will deliver us again. So may the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort comfort your hearts today, each one of you. So if you, as you have reached out in heartfelt compassion in God-honoring ways, May you feel love and compassion coming your way today. You see, it seems so much of life is spent in taking turns. And we all want to be there for each other, imperfect though it may be. My wife, Rebecca, and I have been the unworthy recipients of your kind care. And you have, in a variety of ways, pointed us to the Jesus that truly cares, the Jesus who came to heal the brokenhearted and set the captive free, the Jesus who said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Let me inject here, interject here that the word translated rooms in the Greek, mane, is rare. It occurs only twice in the New Testament, both in the Gospel of John. Now later in this chapter, it is used later in this chapter in verse 23, where Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home, my name, with him. So the text speaks of the Father and of the Son making their home with believers. That is, making themselves present with them. So according to the commentator C.J. Cruz, he says that when we unpack the metaphor of verse 2, mane then we should think not so much of rooms or mansions. Uh, after all, the creator of the universe, uh, it doesn't take long for the creator of the universe to do something, but we're talking about the privilege of abiding in God's house. God is going to prepare a room, a place for us, where we can enjoy his presence. That is exciting. That is wonderful. That is the, the focus of verse 3 where he says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. 
that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. This Jesus also reacted strongly when he saw the disciples rebuke those who were bringing their children to him for a blessing. When Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God is like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. And I'm just thinking of the many ways that, that Christie blessed children through, through school, through whether it was candy, was it through popcorn, through ice cream. And for many of us, Christie blessed children and he blessed us. Christie farmed some ground close to us and for many years uh, grew certified wheat for us, of course with the agreement that I was willing to claim the combine. Uh, and I just, I, I continue to treasure our interactions, his, his cheerful spirit, his ready smile, uh, what, uh, to, in the times that we, we uh, interacted, just uh, were such a blessing. As a deacon, I had the privilege of, of seeing his generosity up close as he often gave a significant portion of his wheat crop away. It was a pleasure to help provide direction for where uh, the needs, where current needs were. He was concerned about needs on the mission field and especially the needs of, of, of uh, single women in missions. And he was concerned that the ministers were appropriately provided for. And when I would express appreciation for his liberal generosity, he would often say, well, I want to be a good steward. He would just acknowledge the blessing of the Lord, and he wanted to be a good steward. And that has brought my attention to the scripture in uh, 2 Corinthians 9, where the Apostle Paul was making arrangements to gather money for the impoverished Christians in Jerusalem. Uh, verse uh, 5 in chapter 9, here again in ESV. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead of, to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised so that it may be will it, ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. And let me insert here, too, that one of my earliest uh, memories of Christie Christ as a customer is that he always wanted to make sure that he planted enough seed. So I think it works in the physical world, and I think it works in the spiritual world. Verse, continuing now in verse 7, each one of us must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work, as it is written. He is distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. Often I had the opportunity to to uh, bring back perhaps uh, notes uh, of thank you because they were anonymous gifts and it was a privilege to, to see saints overflowing with thanksgiving to God for this generosity. Verse 13, by their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. All they long for you and pray for you. 
because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thank God for those prayers. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. You know, when we're talking about hearts that understand the depth of the sacrifice of his son Jesus and personally accept the grace that he offers, person will give generously to the needs of saints without worrying that there just won't be enough to go around or there won't be enough to live on for themselves. And the gratitude of the recipients will bring much praise to God as the attention is focused on the Lord and not on themselves. The attention is focused on Jesus, our high priest. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so we seek the Lord and his strength. We look to the Lord, our dwelling place. And though we walk through the midst of trouble, we respond in gratitude with generosity. We look to the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort for a new awareness of the bright future that we can have. Looking forward to the bright future that marriage supper of the Lamb, that everlasting, we could call it Thanksgiving meal that will go on forever. And with that, thinking about that great time, we will close with this scripture. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Let us bow our heads in worship. Our gracious God and Father, we thank you for the gift of your son Jesus, that great sacrifice on the cross that made possible our, redem our redemption, through whom we can come and find forgiveness through whom the through whom the the sins and the mistakes and the wrongs of our past can be uh, can be blotted out and we can come into complete freedom and harmony with you we thank you for that lord jesus we are grateful that you the god of all comfort will comfort us in our tribulation, whatever tribulation we have, whatever loss we have, wherever we find ourselves um, despairing even of life, we can look to you and know that you can grant us your strength and your grace. Help us, Lord Jesus, to look with anticipation to that time when we can come into your room. But we're not excited about the room, we're excited about the joy of your presence, and knowing that with you there will be joy and peace everlasting. So we thank you for that, 
And we just ask that you work in our hearts and prepare us for that great and eventual great time when we can be with you in all eternity and sit around your table eating 12 manner of fruits and the, uh, enjoying the goodness that you have for us for your sake and for your glory alone as we worship you. We just ask you, Lord Jesus, to go with the family in this time of sadness and loss. I ask that you would just keep them in your shepherd arms. Be with them as they say their final goodbyes. And may you receive all the glory and the praise through Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Brother Laverne, for teaching us from the scriptures and, <clears throat> and uh, pointing out many good things from your relationship with Brother Christ. I want to read for you a poem that is set in a story in England in, uh, I think, the mid-1800s. The poem is entitled, My Grandfather's Clock, and the poet took a, uh, some story and embellished it, of course, as poets can. But uh, the story had been that in an old hotel in England, there was the owner that uh, lived and served people for many years. And when he died at age 90, uh, his clock quit about that same time. It was a tall case clock that uh, stood on the floor because it was so tall. And this poet is Henry Clay Work. He said, my grandfather's clock was too large for the shelf, so it stood 90 years on the floor. It was taller by half than the old man himself, though it weighed not a penny weight more. It was bought on the morn of the day that he was born and was always his treasure and pride. But it stopped short, never to go again, when the old man died. Ninety years without slumbering, his life seconds numbering, it stopped short, never to go again, when the old man died. Here we talk, it talks about ninety years without slumbering. I know that Christ must have taken his turns at nighttime rest, but I think he was a man of action that uh, was even up till the last weeks mowing and gathering leaves and so on and wanting to do it when the family didn't even quite always let him. So he was a man of action. Back to the poem. My grandfather said that of those he could hire, not a servant so faithful he found, for it wasted no time and had but one desire at the close of each week to be wound. And it kept in its place, not a frown on its face, and its hands never hung by its side, but it stopped short, never to go again when the old man died. This line, not a frown on, on his face. I talked with numbers of people, family and, and neighbors, and many people said that they knew Christ as a man with a smile and one that didn't complain about what life brought. Continuing on, it rang and alarmed in the dead of the night, an alarm that for years had been dumb, and we knew that his spirit was pluming for flight, that his hour for departure had come. Still the clock kept the time with a soft and muffled chime as we silently stood by his side, but it stopped short never to go again when the old man died. Ninety years without slumbering, his life seconds numbering, it stopped short, never to go again when the old man died. So Brother Christ lived for 90 years and his heart pumping like the clock did its tick-tock. And this next to the last stanza says, and we knew that his spirit was pluming for flight. I understand from the family that it was a week ago today that they took him to the cemetery and showed him the new stone that had his and his wife's names on them. And 
in the course of the con conversation, it hit home to him that there's a space right here. He asked, is there room for me here? And took comfort in this, that he, he w is being provided for. And we know that through the last years, he had so much been looking forward to going to meet the Lord and, uh, and be relieved here. With that, I'll turn my attention to the obituary written by the family. Chris H. Yoder, 90, of Hutchinson, Kansas, died November 24, 2021, at his home. He was born April 2, 1931, in Hutchinson, to Harmon and Lizzie Garver Yoder. Chris committed his life to Christ in his youth and was a faithful member of Center Amish Mennonite Church. He was known in the community for his cheerful friendliness and grateful spirit. Chris began dairying <clears throat> as a young married man and developed his herd into one of the top producing herds in the state. Hard work, in ingenuity, and loyalty were trademarks of his. On December 25, 1952, he married Elnora May Yoder in Hutchinson. They enjoyed 66 years together. Chris is survived by children Jerry and Ellen Yoder of Grantsville, Maryland, Irene and Merle Yoder, and Betty and Wayne Liebold of Hutchinson, Kansas, Carol and Stan Nisley of Altamont, Kansas, daughter-in-law Mary and Ernest Yoder of Parsons, Kansas, daughter-in-law Tiffany Corsione of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 21 grandchildren, 26 great-grandchildren, brother Ora of Kingfisher, Oklahoma, sisters Orpha Nisley of Clearwater, Florida, and Irma Yoder of Pratts, Virginia, and sister-in-law Mary Yoder of Hutchinson. He was preceded in death by his wife, sons Marvin, Daniel, Delmer, and Arthur, daughter-in-law Ruth Yoder, three sisters, and three brothers. Memorials are suggested for Hands of Christ in care of Elliot Mortuary of Hutchinson. Now <clears throat> we'll turn the attention to uh, brothers uh, Stan and Jonathan. Stan's a son-in-law and Jonathan a grandson, as was Aaron, and we'll give them, them time for tributes. <clears throat> The tribute I'm going to read was written by Carol with input from the rest of the family. His family called him Daddy, Dad, or Papa Hun. To the grandchildren, he was Dotty or Grandpa. But first he was Chris. Chris H. Yoder drew his first breaths in a farmhouse in 1931. We gathered around his bed, watching his last breaths 90 years later in a house only one and one half miles from where he was born. But Chris lived a full, happy life. Christy was named after his grandpa. He was one of 10 in a family with a creative and inventive streak. He was so often injured in his escapades that his mother would ask upon learning that someone got hurt, Wasta Christy? In our childhood, his hands regularly sported, sported a goodly selection of bandages and white tape, splinters and bruises. Now those battle-scarred, calloused hands with the distinctive thumb are soft, his nails uncharacteristically clean and tidy. Chris H., Christy, Daddy. Kristen May had two young sons when he was grievously burned in an explosion leaving him with second and third degree burns over 75% of his body. Mom was at his side for the 17 agonizing weeks in the hospital, while family and church community cared for his sons, his cows, his crops. This experience marked dad in body and soul. 65 years later, he still spoke of the ordeal with humility, highlighting mom's devotion to him and his debt of love to her and to the community. 
Other hard times followed. Marvin's death in a farm accident left Dad heartbroken. We honor him <clears throat> for his reverent response. The Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The aching emptiness opened Dad's heart to make room for two more sons to join the family. Delmer Eugene and Arthur Levon brought our numbers up to eight children. Farming and the dairy were a significant part of Dad's life. In the 50s, he started his herd with sale barn cull cows. With careful attention to rations, he coaxed a lot of milk out of them. When he and Mom traveled east to visit siblings, it seemed not unusual that a cow died in his absence. Upon his return, he didn't reprimand us. Seasoned by sorrow, he was glad it was just a cow. With Arthur's death this past February, Dad outlived four sons and one daughter-in-law. Daniel and Delmer's deaths came seven months apart, and our grief was stark and complex. While we would not have chosen these sorrows, we find that they have enriched us. In Jerry's words, we used to be an ordinary family. Our losses helped us see how precious life is and drew us together. Christ, Christy, Daddy, Dottie, Grandpa. He was a fun-loving man, running races and playing kickball with the grandchildren as he approached 70. Four-wheeler rides were a staple, summer and winter. In their fatherless years, Jonathan, Aaron, and Rachel experienced a special measure of his loving nature. As Dad grew older, he took increasing delight in Betty's world at school. He relished the opportunity to make buttery popcorn to share with her students. This, along with his own remarkable capacity for popcorn consumption, earned him the nickname Popcorn Christie. He cultivated friendship with the younger children, taking the kindergarten-aged ones, taking the kindergarten aged by ones or twos for a day at the sale barn or the Hutchinson Zoo, and of course, sirloin stockade. Dad never outgrew his appetite for traveling and adventure, while Mom most enjoyed the scenery available at home. Europe, Canada, Costa Rica, El Salvador. Five days before his death, he was still hoping for more travel opportunities. He was always curious and interested in people and places, sometimes literally on the edge of his seat so as not to miss anything. Hard work was Dad's favorite form of recreation. In his mid to late 80s, working with Hands of Christ was a blessing to him, extending his years of service. Sharing his pickup and trailer was a pleasure, and so were the mowing jobs. The coffee corner was another outlet for Dad. He drank no coffee. He went to be with people. In the lonely months between Mom's death and his own debilitating stroke, he was a regular, often going three times a week. After the stroke, much of Dad's memory was erased, both short-term and long-term. The decades faded in and out of his conversation. Particularly difficult was his inability to remember that Mom had died. Always wishing to have something to do, he mowed his yard. His acreage shrunk to the front yard. He was still the devoted farmer, mowing twice, thrice, even four times a week. <laughs> Once he came in from mowing, collapsed in his chair, and swiveled to look out the window, and wondered aloud if he could mow today. <laughs> the last months, Dad longed for his turn to go home, his head drooping momentarily each time another old friend passed the finish line ahead of him. As siblings, we give Betty special credit for her intentional and joyous caregiving, and thank God for bringing Wayne's strength to the task these last months. Christy, Dottie, Dad, you were imperfect, but humble. All that was Christ-like in you, we want to imitate. All that was not, we forgive. The last words Irene heard from your lips summarize how you wanted to live. We just want to be grateful and caring and sharing. 
this and other familiar phrases from your prayers. Let your light shine through us to others. Live unselfish unto your glory. We take with us and intend to follow you on the path of Jesus. There are a number of grandchildren who, for various reasons, are unable to be with us this morning. And one of those, Karen Bontrager, wrote the tribute I'm about to read. And I believe many of the sentiments she expressed are shared by the rest of us as grandchildren. <clears throat> I'm going to miss this dear man I call Dottie. He lived a life of gratefulness and generosity and made friends with children wherever he went. Candy will usually do that, you know. There was always slushy, cold pop in his shop refrigerator, and his pickup was actually trained to turn into McDonald's. He said, I have delighted mem delightful memories of him teaching me how to spin kitties on his four-wheeler, riding along on his weekly sale barn runs, and playing feisty games of aggravation while munching on his delicious, buttery popcorn. He was such a classically fun grandpa to me. I'm so grateful for the gift I had of living just down the road from him for much of my life. The fact that my own daughters got to know and love him too feels like an extra gift. We'll all miss you, Dottie. Karen. Praise God for those uh, tributes and words. I too have a few things that have come to me and of course some of these things start to be a little bit of a refrain so I'll, I'll touch them very lightly. But as a neighbor I noticed too how he handled his losses and uh, just thank, I'm so thankful for the grace that he received and applied to not complain and how he opened his uh, home with his wife for the orphans that uh, came to live with them. Somehow the verses in Colossians 3, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ, fit my memory of Christ. He was one to serve heartily, and he did his dairying and his farming with excellence and diligence, and he gave much to the Lord, to the work of the Lord in the church. Now a few comments as a neighbor. His oldest son was our first employee, and he was a very capable and faithful employee. Uh, God blessed our time together. We knew Chris as a man who loaned equipment freely. Uh, we, I remember borrowing a number of trailers through the year, early years especially. And my sons growing up just right on the same corner there uh, put together a number of their memories too. One of them said that Chris was always positive and upbeat he was engaging and smiling and interested in me. That is, in his first person statement. <clears throat> and others chimed in how that he, they appreciated how he allowed them to hunt starlings and sparrows and pigeons, squirrels and rabbits in his tree belt and empty silo and hay barn. One of the things they discovered was when the little pigeons were in their nests, they could bring them home and uh, keep them alive, uh, feeding them with the rolled milo and so on, and developed quite a little flock of, of pigeons that uh, went along with some of the fantails and others that they bought elsewhere. One son said that he, uh, Chris took him to the sale barn on occasion, and he remembers how special it was when he bought that hamburger for lunch. It was a big deal to him because he showed an interest in him. And 
He said, and then he allowed me to help fill the silo by running the blower and being patient if I put too much water in with it that plugged up the blower. And they remembered, a number of them, going along to the West Farm with Chris and how that he allowed them to help Ronald with the milking. Those were formative times. And then in more recent years, he asked one of them to order a predator control light that he heard was available online but didn't have the skills to access. It's one of these blinking, well, it's a, it, on, this one had uh, lights on four sides to, uh, that would flash and uh, irritate predators that would, were coming. One of them mentions that wasn't it him that, brought, that gave us rides out in the snow in the pasture on an old car hood, those are memories that they, they have of their neighbor. And I noticed some of the things that the daughters here said. One of them one said very clearly, I loved my father. I think she spoke for the others too. And I noticed also that while relationships suffered somewhere in the last years, it was healing to assist him with personal care, especially because they received Chris's gratitude for the service. And I also recognize and applaud Betty and Wayne for their sacrificial care of Chris as he needed it. We're all headed the same direction, aren't we? And we've started the service out with thoughts of eternity and a holy, eternal God and the frailty of man. We continued throughout the service to thank God for a man who, though he imperfectly served, did choose to serve a perfect God and returned again and again to that same source for his courage and his strength. And he gave lots of courage to the rest of us so this brings us to the end of this memorial service, except for the final viewing, and then the burial, and the sharing of a meal for all who care. Uh, we thank God for the service of the ones behind the scenes who have been preparing the food, and we certainly recognize that there's a significant investment in times like this by those that are appointed to be the funeral directors. So let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for how you've blessed us in getting to know and love Brother Christ. Thank you for the uh, ways that we can learn from him, and I pray that you would help us to be forgiving and faithful as we go from here. I, I pray your blessing on the noon meal and thank you for it. Pray your blessing on these, this final viewing now as we turn our attention to the funeral directors. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me come.
the sunset, oh blissful morning, when with our Savior heaven is begun, first toiling ended, oh glorious dawning, beyond the sunset when day is done, beyond the sunset no clouds will gather, Storms will threaten, no fears unknown. O day of gladness, O day unending, beyond the sunset, eternal joy. Beyond the sunset, O glad reunion, with our dear loved ones who have gone before. In that fair homeland, we'll know no parting beyond the sunset No disappointment in heaven, no weariness, sorrow, or pain, no hearts that are bleeding and broken, no song with a minor refrain, no clouds of our earthly horizon will never appear in the sky. For Sunshine and gladness with never a song or a sigh. I'm bound for that beautiful sea. 
and the glories I there shall behold. What a joy that will be when my Savior I see in that beautiful city of gold. We'll never pay rent for our mansion. The taxes will never come due. Our garments will never grow threadbare, but always be faithless and new. We'll never be hungry or thirsty, nor languish in poverty there. For all the rich bounties of heaven, his sanctified children will share. My Lord is prepared for his own, where all the redeemed of all ages sing glory around the white throne. Sometimes I grow homesick for heaven, and the glories I there shall behold. What a joy that will be when my Savior I see. of glory, for there we shall never more die. The old will be young there forever, transformed in a moment of time. Immortal will stand in his likeness, the stars and the sun to outshine. I'm bound for that beautiful city. My Lord is prepared for his own, where all the redeemed of all ages sing glory around the white throne. Sometimes I grow homesick for heaven, and the glories I there shall behold. What a joy that will be when my Savior I see. Face with Christ my Savior, face to face what will it be, when with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ, who died for me. Face to face shall I behold him, far beyond the starry sky. In all his glory, I shall see him by and by. Only faintly now I see him with the darkening veil between. But a blessed day is coming when his glory shall. Face to face shall I behold him, far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory, I shall see him by and by. What rejoicing in his breath! When our banished grief and pain, when the crooked ways are straightened and the 
darkling shall be plain. Face to face shall I behold him, far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all his glory, I shall see him moment, face to face to see and know, face to face with my Redeemer, Jesus Christ who loves me so, face to face shall I behold him, far beyond the starry sky, to face in all this glory, I shall see him by and by. My life's work is ended, and I cross the swelling tide. When the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and his smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know, I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him by the prince of the nails in his hand. Oh, the soul-thrilling rapture when I view his blessed face and the luster of his kindly beaming eye. How my whole heart will praise him for the mercy, love, and grace that prepared for me a mansion in the sky. I shall know, I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know, I shall know him, I shall know him, by the prince of the nails in his hand. Through the gates to the city in a robe of spotless white, he will lead me where no tears will ever fall. In the glad song of ages I shall mingle with delight, but I long to see my Savior first of all. I shall know, I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him, by the prince of the nails in his hand.